Before we get into today's video, we just want to say a big thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? I know I have a problem with working too much and letting things fester in my mind. As a result, I'm always anxious. Well, that's just me, and many of us have something we're dealing with, so that's why I think you should do what I did and check out BetterHelp. When you register with BetterHelp, they'll assess your needs and then connect you with your own licensed professional therapist. Personally, I find it helpful to talk freely to someone who is outside my family and social circle. BetterHelp is available worldwide, and they have a wide array of services, so you may be able to find an expert that isn't available to you locally. What I like about BetterHelp is that it's not a crisis line or self-help, it's professional counseling that's done securely online. Simply log on to your account anytime and fire off a message to your therapist. They'll respond in a timely manner with a thoughtful message. You can also schedule weekly video or phone sessions. So with BetterHelp, you will never have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room like you do with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is committed to finding you the right therapist. So it's easy and free to change counselors. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional therapy if financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Please visit BetterHelp.com slash criminally listed, that's better H-E-L-P, and join the over a million people who are taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. BetterHelp has a special offer for criminally listed viewers. Get 10% off your first month by going to BetterHelp.com slash criminally listed. Feel better, take charge of your life, and help support criminally listed by checking out BetterHelp.com slash criminally listed. Number 3. Dennis Gianta On February 5th, 2002, 26-year-old electrician Dennis Gianta returned to his home in Melbourne, Australia. Dennis had been out working. When he got home, he hopped in the shower. His wife, Laura Gianta, was in bed sleeping. Suddenly, Laura was awoken by a commotion in the bedroom. She saw Dennis struggling with a masked man who was armed with a homemade sword. Dennis screamed at the man to leave them alone and to take anything he wanted. But the masked man kept swinging the sword at Dennis and blood went everywhere. Laura said it was like bottles exploding. Laura bolted out of bed He got to the balcony through the sliding door. She then started screaming for help. Fearing that the masked man with the sword may attack her next, Laura jumped the 16 feet to the garage roof. Although Laura was seriously injured in the fall, she managed to get from the roof of the garage to the roof of a car and then she got to the ground. Laura then made her way to a neighbor's home and they called for help. Sadly, it was too late for 26-year-old Dennis Gianta. He was unarmed and naked, but he had tried to defend himself against the man with the sword. The medical examiner determined that he had been stabbed and slashed 55 times in the head, chest, and abdomen. The cause of death was a combination of a collapsed lung and blood loss. Laura had suffered a compound fracture of the ankle, four broken bones in her foot, and a cracked vertebra. She stayed in the hospital for three weeks. After Laura was released from the hospital, she was confined to a wheelchair for two months, and she spent a year on crutches. The police determined that the killer broke into the couple's house before Dennis got home, and he hid. He waited for Dennis to finish showering. As Dennis was walking to the bed naked after his shower, the masked man with the sword attacked him and ultimately killed him. The murder weapon was found in the neighbor's garden. The police also found a bloody glove at the crime scene. At first, the police couldn't figure out who would want to brutally murder a 26-year-old electrician. It turned out that Dennis and Laura were growing and cultivating marijuana. So the police thought that Dennis's murder might be connected to that. 
but then the police learned that Dennis's family had been involved in a feud. Dennis's father, Peter Gianta, drove an ice cream truck. Peter's nephew, 45-year-old Francesco Mangioni, also drove an ice cream truck. Over a decade earlier, Mangioni and Peter had gotten into a turf dispute over who could sell ice cream in what areas. Things got to be so bad that in 1993, nine years before the murder, there was a brawl involving several family members. During the brawl, Dennis and his cousin, Francesco Mangioni, scuffled. As the family members fought, Dennis's father, Peter, got into his ice cream truck and started driving. He hit his sister, who was Mangioni's mother, with the truck. She was injured, but she survived being hit by the ice cream truck. Sometime after that brawl, Mangioni and Peter crossed paths again. Mangioni challenged him to a fight. Peter decided not to fight his nephew, and he started selling ice cream in a different area of the city. The police went to the house where Francesco Mangioni was living. Mangioni was born in Sicily, Italy in July 1957. He and his family immigrated to Australia when Mangioni was 12. He was trained as an electrician and he worked as a radio tradesman. In 1989, after Mangioni lost his job, he started operating his ice cream truck. In 1995, Mangioni and his wife, whom he had four children with, separated. In 1998, Mangioni started dating another woman. After Mangioni and his wife split up, he moved in with his parents. At the time of Dennis's murder, Mangioni was still living with his parents and he was still dating the same woman. The police searched Mangioni's parents' property. In the shed, the police found a piece of metal that had been fashioned like the murder weapon. On the glove that was found at the crime scene, there was DNA from two people. Of course, some of the blood came from the victim. The other blood most likely came from the killer. Mangioni's blood was compared to the blood on the glove. The DNA on the glove was matched to Mangioni. Mangioni's father's car was searched and blood was found inside of it. The blood was a match to blood found at the crime scene. In February 2004, Francesco Mangioni went to trial for the murder of his 26-year-old cousin. Mangioni claimed he was innocent. Mangioni's lawyer said that while there had been a fight nine years before the murder, there was no residual hostility between the family members. Also, nothing had happened recently that would have prompted Mangioni to butcher his cousin who wasn't involved in the ice cream business. The prosecution argued that the blood evidence placed Mangioni at the crime scene. The trial lasted for 10 days. Francesco Mangioni was sentenced to 22 years in prison with the chance of parole after 18 years. As of 2010, Mangioni is serving a sentence at the HM Prison Barwin in Lara, Victoria. He'll be able to apply for parole in 2022 when he's 65 years old. Number 2. John Nutting and Judith Fleming Joseph Hunter Parker was born in 1972 in Dinwiddie County, Virginia. Growing up, he loved the outdoors. He enjoyed hunting, fishing, swimming, and climbing trees. Parker always seemed to be happy. He was so upbeat that his nickname was Smiley. Unfortunately, Parker was hiding a dark secret. It turned out that his great uncle had been sexually abusing several children and Parker was one of them. He had been sexually abusing Parker for six years. 
For his crimes, the great uncle was only sentenced to five days in jail. He was given three months of probation. Joseph Parker continued on with his life as if nothing had happened. His friends and family thought he was funny. He apparently did a great impression of the Saturday Night Live character, the church lady. Joseph Parker graduated from high school in 1991. Shortly afterward, he got a job at a factory that manufactured Kevlar. He also became a volunteer firefighter. After a few years, he left his job at the factory for a better paying job as a forklift driver. In the summer of 1998, Parker flew out to California to visit his sister who had moved there. He liked the area and he decided to move there himself. He ended up in Orange, California where he got a job as a locksmith. It wasn't long after Parker relocated that he started to have issues with his mental health. Parker's family had a history of mental illness. His mother and two aunts had bipolar disorder and another aunt had schizophrenia. While it's impossible to say what, if anything, caused Parker's mental health to worsen, his family said that there was a trigger at his workplace. A co-worker resembled the great uncle who had sexually abused him for six years, and this troubled Parker. Parker told his family that the TV was talking to him. He was also paranoid and said that his boss was out to get him. At work, Parker would listen to a classical song on repeat for hours. He claimed that the song kept him calm. One day, Parker set his bed on fire while he was still in his apartment because he said it had become infested with demons. On March 13, 2000, Parker was at work at the locksmith shop. Suddenly, he screamed, it's a matter of life and death. He then pushed everyone out of the locksmith's shop and locked the doors. The police had to be called. Parker explained to the police that he thought the demons were killing women and children. This episode led to Joseph Parker being placed in a hospital. But he would only stay for a few days and then he would be released. This became a cycle for Parker. He would be hospitalized for a few days and then released. He was eventually diagnosed with schizophrenia. The hospitals and the clinics where he stayed saw no reason to keep him institutionalized for extended periods. He never acted violently and he tried to live a productive life by having a job and renting an apartment. But Parker was suffering from severe mental problems. He constantly listened to music on his headphones to block out the voices in his head. He told several family members and friends that the voices were telling him to do bad things. He also said that he might become violent. After Joseph barricaded himself in the locksmith shop, he lost his job. In the summer of 2001, Parker was hired as a grocery beggar at an Albertson grocery store in Irvine, California. Parker had a roommate and she tried to get him professional help for his schizophrenia. Unfortunately, Parker would act like nothing was wrong with him when he met with healthcare professionals. But Parker didn't completely shy away from help. In November 2002 and in January 2003, he called 911. He said that he needed help or he'd become violent. Both times he was taken to a hospital, prescribed drugs, and then released. But he would stop taking the drugs after a few days because he didn't like how they made him feel. In the spring of 2003, Parker's roommate kicked him out because of his erratic behavior. 
He ended up crashing on a couch in a friend's garage. Parker stopped going to work at the Albertson grocery store near the end of May 2003. Not long after he stopped showing up for work, Parker was told he had 30 days to move out of the garage because of his strange behavior. The incident that led to Parker being kicked out involved him making a circle of salt around himself to keep the devil out. On the morning of Sunday, June 29, 2003, six-year-old John Nutting was working at the Albertsons where Parker had worked. Nutting had been working for the grocery store for 43 years. Nutting had five children and nine grandchildren. Two of his grandchildren were still living with him. Nutting was looking forward to retiring. In his garage, he had a 1947 Chevy he wanted to restore. Nutting was not supposed to be working that morning, but he was covering for someone who was attending a church service. Also working that morning was 55-year-old Judith Fleming. Fleming met her husband when she was just five years old, and he was seven. They were high school sweethearts, and they got married in 1967. She gave birth to two daughters. In December 2002, Fleming and her husband celebrated their 35th wedding anniversary. For 28 years, Fleming had worked in the grocery store business. She had been hired at the Albertson store about four years earlier. Like Nutting, she was looking forward to retiring soon. At around 9.30 that morning, there were about 30 to 40 customers in the store. The 30-year-old Joseph Parker sauntered into the store. He was wearing a green beret and a dark ankle-length trench coat. He walked up to 55-year-old Judith Fleming. From under his coat, Parker pulled out a three-foot-long samurai sword they had purchased two days earlier at a martial arts studio. He swung it into Fleming's neck and nearly decapitated her. Her body fell to the ground. Parker then turned the sword on 60-year-old John Nutting and slashed him several times. He also attacked Eva Merez, a store clerk, and customers Ryan Flanagan and Thomas Peters. Some of the employees managed to corner Parker in the meat department. They held him at bay with barbecue utensils and trash can lids. About 10 minutes after the first call came into 911, three police officers arrived on the scene. The police found Parker in the meat department and he refused to surrender. Instead, he laughed and confronted one of the officers with his sword. Police officer Michael Fender was armed with a cold AR-15 assault rifle. He fired six shots at Parker. Parker was hit once in the chest and he fell to the floor. Parker was taken to the same hospital as his victims. 30-year-old Joseph Parker was pronounced dead not long after arriving at the hospital. 55-year-old Judith Fleming and 6-year-old John Nutting were also pronounced dead. One of the other victims, Thomas Peters, underwent nine hours of surgery for wounds on his hands, his shoulder, and his forehead. Peters and the other two victims ultimately survived their wounds. Police officer Michael Fender was hailed as a hero for ending the rampage. Fender later said that it was an awful situation and he wouldn't wish it upon anyone. He said that after the shooting, he suffered anxiety attacks and he had problems sleeping. He also started drinking more. Fender eventually saw a psychologist who taught him how to deal with his feelings after the deadly shooting. Number 1. Robert Schwartz Near the end of 2001, Dr. Robert Schwartz, 57, lived alone in a farmhouse in Leesburg, Virginia. 
Robert was a nationally regarded biophysicist who was known for his work in biometrics and DNA sequencing. In 1978, an article Robert authored with the famed chemist Margaret Oakley Dayhoff was published in the peer-reviewed journal Science. The article was highly regarded and has been cited nearly 600 times since it was published. Robert had been married, but about five years earlier, he had lost his wife Joan to cancer. Robert and Joan had three children together, Jesse, Catherine, and Clara. Robert and his youngest child, Clara, never really got along. Things only got worse after Joan died. Clara was just 15 when her mother passed away. After her mother's death, Clara became interested in the gothic subculture. She wore dark clothes, listened to goth music, and became fascinated with vampires, witchcraft, and the occult. Clara graduated from high school in spring 2000, and she started attending James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia that fall. On December 10, 2001, Robert's co-workers called one of his neighbors. Robert had not shown up for work that day or the day before without notifying anyone. He had also missed an important meeting. This was very uncharacteristic of Robert. The neighbor managed to get into Robert's farmhouse and he made a horrifying discovery. Robert was lying in a pool of dried blood. The neighbor immediately called the police. The police were able to piece together what they believed happened. Two days earlier, Robert was getting ready to eat dinner. It appears that someone came to his door and Robert let them in. Robert was then hacked, slashed, and stabbed to death with a long-bladed instrument. He had sustained over 30 injuries. On the back of his neck, the killer carved an X. The police talked to the neighbors. One of them remembered that a car with three young people got stuck in the mud outside Robert's home around the time of the murder. They went to the neighbor's home and called a tow truck. The first people that the police investigated was Robert's family. Because of Clara's strained relationship with her father, she quickly became a person of interest. When her father was killed, Clara was over 100 miles away at university. The police asked Clara if they could talk to her friends. She gave them the names of four people, 12-year-old Patrick House, 21-year-old Michael Full, 19-year-old Catherine Inglis, and 18-year-old Kyle Holbert. The police talked to those individuals and they unraveled a disturbing story. Clara became friends with Catherine Inglis and her boyfriend, Michael Full, in her senior year of high school. Clara told them their father would hit on her and poison her food. She also said that she wished that her father was dead. Clara said that when he died, she would inherit a third of a million dollars from him. Patrick House and Clara started dating in August 2001. Clara also told him that her father was abusive and he was trying to poison her. One time, Clara, Inglis, and House went out for dinner. Clara said that she thought her father contacted the chef because her steak had been poisoned. Clara told House that she wanted to poison her father, but she wanted to make it look like he had died naturally. She had even read books about herbal poisons. Clara was obsessed with role-playing games. She played Vampire the Masquerade Quest 5 in a game she created called Underworld. Clara's character in Underworld was the Lord of Chaos. She assigned House to the character of Assassin. Clara then insisted that House act out his role as Assassin and kill her father. 
Patrick Coe said they became uneasy with Clara's desire to murder her father, so he broke up with her. In September 2001, Clara was at a Renaissance Fair and she met 18-year-old Kyle Hulbert. Hulbert had a history of mental illness. Since the age of six, he had been institutionalized several times. He had also lived in a series of foster homes. He had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Clara and Hulbert had a near instant connection. Soon their relationship became very intense. Hulbert took on the role of being Clara's protector. Clara told Hulbert that her father abused her and was poisoning her. She claimed that her father laced her steaks with poison and put sulfuric acid in lemons. Hulbert believed that Robert was hurting Clara, so he agreed to kill him. On December 8, 2001, Michael Fulton and Catherine Inglis drove Kyle Hulbert to Dr. Robert Schwartz's home. Hulbert had a 27-inch samurai sword strapped to his side. Hulbert had owned the sword for some time and it was one of his most prized possessions. Hulbert knocked on Robert's door and Robert let him in. Hulbert said they accused Robert of abusing Clara and he denied it. Hulbert said they looked in Robert's eyes and he saw in Robert's eyes that he was guilty, so he attacked him with the sword. He claimed that Robert smiled at him and this made him even more angry. So he ended up inflicting at least 30 wounds on Robert. Hulbert said they had been given permission to murder Robert by otherworldly vampires and creatures named Saba, Ordog, and Nicodemus. After murdering Dr. Robert Schwartz, Hulbert walked back out to the car. He handed the weapon to Full, who wiped it down and put it in the car's trunk. The trio then ran into a problem. It was raining and their car had become stuck in the mud. They went to a neighbor's home and called for a tow truck. When Full got home, he hid the sword in his bedroom. The day after Robert's body was found, Kyle Holbert, Michael Full, and Catherine Inglis were all arrested. Making a case against them was easy. Not only did they all confess, but the murder weapon was found in Full's bedroom. Also, since they called a tow truck for the neighbor's home, it was easy to place them at the crime scene around the time of the murder. On February 1st, 2002, 20-year-old Claire Schwartz was arrested. Claire's brother and sister wrote a letter to the judge requesting that Clara stay in jail until her trial because they thought she was dangerous to herself and others. They also pointed out that there was no evidence that their father was abusive because he wasn't abusive. In fact, no one ever saw an unexplained bruise or mark on Clara. 21-year-old Claire Schwartz went to trial in October 2002. Claire's lawyer argued that she didn't know that Kyle Holbert was really going to kill her father. She apparently just thought that playing to kill her father was part of a role-playing game. Michael Full and Catherine Inglis had made plea agreements and they testified against Clara. Claire's former boyfriend, Patrick House, also testified. He told the court that Clara had talked about killing her father so frequently and seemed so serious about it that he ended the relationship. Clara's trial lasted five days. The jury deliberated for just four hours. Clara was found guilty and the jury recommended a sentence of 48 years of prison. The judge followed the recommendation and Clara Schwartz was sentenced to 48 years of prison. Catherine Inglis was sentenced to one year in prison for conspiracy to commit murder. 
Michael Fole pleaded guilty to second degree murder and he was sentenced to 18 years of prison. Fole is no longer listed in the database of Virginia inmates, so he most likely has been released from prison. Kyle Holbert pleaded guilty to first degree murder and he was sentenced to life without the chance of parole. At the time of this video, Holbert is 37 and he is serving a sentence at the River North Correctional Center in Independence, Virginia. 37-year-old Claire Schwartz is serving her sentence at the Fluvanna Correctional Center for Women in Troy, Virginia. Her earliest possible release date is February 11, 2043. She'll be 59 years old. Thank you so much for watching today's video. We hope you found it interesting. Recently, we launched our podcast, Into the Killing. In each episode, we examined cold cases that were eventually solved. Sometimes the cases were solved after decades. Throughout the series, we will also talk about the history of forensic science. So far, we've discussed the science of fingerprinting and genetic fingerprinting. In our most recent episode, we talked about the latest step in forensic science that has revolutionized cold case investigating, genetic genealogy, which is also known as forensic genealogy. The case we look at is the Bear Brook case where the remains of four females were found in two barrels. For years, the victims were unidentified, as with their killer. But thanks to the hard work of several investigators, the case was cracked after three decades. You can find Into the Killing on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else you find your favorite podcasts. Once again, thank you so much for watching.